grief, more times than not, that's how it starts. We think just yesterday, just last night, just this morning, I talked to him, things weren't like this. Man, the news can hit us in a way that leaves us shocked, surprised. I remember it was April 19th, and my mom called. Her and my dad were on the way to Duke which, uh, for a procedure, which doctors said was routine and outpatient. They weren't worried about it. Dad wasn't worried about it, but mom had been worried about it. And so she said, uh, hey, do you wanna drive up and meet us somewhere on 95 uh, so that we can pray? And I was thinking like, oh man, that's about two hours there, two hours back for about five minutes of prayer. Why don't we FaceTime, mom? We could talk, I call you. We could pray a couple times on the way. It'd be even better, right? And so I call and we pray a couple times. They finally get to Duke and do all the check-in stuff. A couple hours pass. And I was expecting the call to say, hey, dad's out, just wanted you to know everything's okay. And when mom called, man, she was just sobbing. I couldn't, I couldn't understand what she was saying. Dad had had a brain bleed. They had to do an emergency craniotomy to give his brain some space, but he was there at Duke and non-responsive. I just couldn't believe just a little while ago, we talked, he was joking. I was praying with him, like, seriously? Well, almost eight months later to the day, dad passed away, went on to be with the Lord. Mom had been his primary caregiver. They had moved from several different facilities ultimately to our, our house. And along the way, I thought we had kind of started grieving. We'd been praying for a miracle, believing that God could do it, but with each passing holiday or event that dad used to be a part of, realizing that he couldn't be a part of it and things didn't seem to be progressing in the way that they thought we thought they would. I, I felt like we were grieving a little bit along the way, even though we weren't talking about it. But man, in the two months since his passing, it has been a tough season for our family. In fact, just this past week, my mom said, hey, I just want you to know I'm really struggling. Um, when I close my eyes, all I can see is your dad from the last year. Uh, and all I wanna see is the 39 years before that. Just the week before he passed, they celebrated their 40th wedding anniversary, and mom was like, I want to remember all of the good years, but all I see is the year where I was his caregiver. I don't wanna lose those memories. You know, by definition, grief means deep distress, an unfortunate outcome, a cause for suffering. The words are true, but it, it kind of feels like Webster maybe pulled a committee together and said, hey guys, we need to try to describe this emotion in which none of us have ever actually felt, right? If I were to describe grief just in my own words, I think it's the most avoided, undesirable, confusing, painful emotion that there is. It carries with it a heaviness that you just can't sit down. It's not as much a burden that you carry as it is one that just sits on you. It's all consuming, there's no escaping it. It impacts you mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually. It can keep you awake when you wanna go to sleep. It can make you feel like going to sleep in times that you need to be awake. It can cloud your thinking, lead to poor decision making and wildly impacts your moods. Lots of highs and, and lows. Grief is a global certainty. It crosses over language barriers, cultural differences, socioeconomic backgrounds. It doesn't favor uh, race or genders. While there are many people in this world who will never taste the, the sweetness of success or really grab hold of, of peace or ex experience a season of happiness in their lives, every single one of us will experience grief at some point in our lives. Jesus said it this way in John 16 there on your outline here, on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. Oh, and welcome to Seacoast, by the way. My name is Josh <laughs> Walters. <laughs> Some of y'all are thinking like, for real, Walters? I brought a friend today, you know? <laughs> You're not like this. I know, there's nothing fun about grief, but man, just stick, stick with me. So listen, bye. Testimony, how many of you, would, here in Mount Pleasant at one of the distant campuses or online, how many of you would say that you have a testimony of having experienced some trials and sorrows in your life? Every hand, man, we all have 
to some degree. Well, for the last few weeks, we've been in a series called This Is Us, where we've been looking at some uh, common themes from the popular television show. And grief is an unwanted emotion that seems to make an appearance in just about every episode. In some episodes, it's in the, the death of Jack and Rebecca's baby, their third child when, uh, when it was born. In others, it's in the death of, of Jack's father due to his uh, struggle with alcohol, or Randall's father, William, and his struggle with cancer, or ultimately Jack's death himself. In other episodes, it has to do with, with Kate and Toby's miscarriage, or in the pain and regret of Kevin's divorce, or in the death of uh, Annie's pet lizard. Death, <laughs> y'all laugh, that's serious for an eight-year-old, you know what I'm saying? I think part of the reason the show resonates so powerfully is because of how gracefully it tells the story of grief. Uh, for some reason, we can sense our story in their story, and because of that, it brings about a lot of emotions. Uh, this past Monday morning, I, I Googled This Is Us Grief video. I wanted to find what were some of the clips from the show that would resonate with the message, and that led me to searching This Is Us Grief Kevin, This Is Us Grief Randall, and after about three hours, I had seen every character's greatest moments of pain before lunch, right? I had cried every tear I had in my body. I was starting to feel dehydrated, you know? <laughs> I realized that I hated this message, I hated this series, and I wanted to punch somebody in the face, <laughs> you know? <laughs> All before lunch is just where I was at. When was the last time you experienced grief? You know, we're quick to associate that emotion with the loss of a loved one, which is true, it definitely is, but by definition, deep distress, an unfortunate outcome, a cause for suffering, that could be brought about by a lot of different circumstances. Maybe for some of you, it's professionally. All of your life, you've dreamed of being an athlete, a pilot, a soldier, a, you know, fill in the blank, whatever that was for you. And just before grabbing hold of the dream, you learned something, for some reason, it wasn't gonna be possible for you. That was Pastor Michael's story here at the Mount Pleasant campus. All of his life, he had wanted to be a pilot. He had prepared for it. And just as he was entering flight school, he had a physical and learned that he had a medical condition that was gonna keep that from being a reality for him that he was unaware of. Now, for any of you at this campus that know and love Pastor Michael, man, praise God that, that he didn't become a pilot, right? That God had other plans for him. But whatever the case, when we don't get to attain or grab hold of a dream we've always wanted, it can cause us to enter into a season of grief. Maybe for some of you, you've always dreamed of starting a family and you find the right guy which took a lot more time than you were expecting, right? They're hard to come by, just kidding. And you approach this thing God's way, you pray about it, you go to start a family only to realize that there's something going on inside of you that you weren't aware of and that you weren't going to be able to have kids on your own. Or maybe, it's even a good thing, right? You raise your kids up to ultimately send them out of the house and now your last kid is going off and moving out and as excited as you are about it, you're starting to have some thoughts and feelings of what this empty nest season is gonna look like. It means the, the kids are gone and while you're excited, there's some grief that comes with that as to what it now looks like for you as a mom or a dad. Things are gonna be different. What's interesting about grief is how it presents itself. It's not difficult to identify emotions like anger or sadness. In fact, all you have to do is stand out in the parking lot here at the Mount Pleasant campus and peer in the window of cars passing by you know, to pick up on some anger as people are trying to get out of the parking lot. But anger and sadness are just two of many emotions that someone is going through grief has on what they would describe as an emotional roller coaster. Man, that's been my life for the last two months. Not to mention how I feel about my dad's passing. Man, he was our boy's hero. We have four boys, and man, he was an incredible people. He would drive into town to go on their school field trips with them. Uh, he would drive up for rec games, sporting events. He would surprise them, pick them up for school, take them out to ice cream. He loved to snuggle and spoil them to no end. He would do the same with our girls. Him and my mom would drive up and pick up the girls along with a couple of their friends and they'd drive up to Charlotte, go to Carowinds for the weekend. My dad spoiled Katie. Uh, we would go to see them and every time without fail, we would go to leave and he would give her a hug and grab her hand to say something sweet. 
and uh, there would be a transfer of cash that happened, a tightly folded wad of 20s. It used to be my money, right? <laughs> At some point, there was a transition, and he started giving it to her. Thankfully, she was a good sharer, and she'd get in the car, and I'd say, so, so, so what do he give you? I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> or, or dad would call me and say, uh, him and Katie talked four or five times a week, and so he would call her, and she would be looking at furniture online or in some, some furniture store, and dad would eventually call me to say, hey, listen, I've been thinking about as much as mom and I are coming up the road there. I need something comfortable to sit on. Will you go to, go to this place and buy that couch for Katie? Just put it on, put it on my card. I'm like, what? I want stuff too, you know? <laughs> like buying everything for Katie. Used to be my deal, you know? And he was a giver, a lover. Man, it's been hard for us to get used to living in a world without him. It's been equally difficult for us to have grace for one another. Every night going to bed, our boys wanna hear peepaw stories. It's like, man, I've long run out of stories to tell about dad. Now I just kind of make up things that sound like they might be true about him, you know? <laughs> Katie and I are, are tired. It's like we're short with each other. Find ourselves arguing and, and frustrated and questioning like what is wrong with us? And we have to keep reminding ourselves that man, we're in a season of grief. Something that was very much a part of our lives and still is but isn't in the same way and we're in a season of grief, we have to have grace for one another. Well, for the last 50 years, counselors, counselors and psychologists have been studying people's response to grief as a result of a book written in 1969 by a woman named Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, in which she wrote a book that identified five different stages or categories of grief there at the top of your outline I wanna take just a minute and talk through. First of which is upon receiving hard news, experiencing a loss of some kind, we can enter into a season of shock or disbelief much like we saw of Randall in the video. You know, just the night before, Dad was playing the piano and singing. He was fine. There's no way his organs are shutting down. I don't believe it. Or maybe you, you get a, a hard diagnosis and you think like, man, I've eaten healthy. I get good sleep. I drink enough water. I've worked out my whole life. There's no way I have cancer. Or we've gone on date nights. We go to marriage conferences. We pray together. There's no way my spouse would do that to me a season of, of disbelief and shock. Ultimately, as reality starts to set in and you realize, man, this is my life. This is my reality now. It can give way to anger. You're mad. I've seen this happen in other people's lives, but I never imagined it would happen to me. And because you're mad, man, you take it out on the people that are closest to you, that are, are walking through the story with you. That anger can give way to bargaining as you ask a, a series of if only questions or statements, you think, well, if only we would have gotten a second opinion, or if only I would have listened to her more, if only I would have loved him better, if only we would have eaten healthier or exercised, then maybe things would have been different. And that can bring on incredible guilt because you take on responsibility you were never meant to carry, thinking that in some way, had you lived differently, acted differently, been different, you could have changed the outcome, but you couldn't. Because of that, Man, it can bring about incredible depression, a sadness, a sorrow that you just can't climb out of, feeling responsible for the situation that you're in. But ultimately, by the grace of God, it would give way to a season of acceptance and hope where you embrace the mortality and inevitable future of yourself or a loved one and that it brings about more stable emotions in your life. Those stages don't necessarily happen in that order and the intensity changes for whatever the loss or grief might be, but if you think about the last time you experienced grief in your life in light of those stages, is there one or two of them that you tended to hang out on? Any places in particular where you found yourself getting stuck or, or maybe you just avoided entirely? It can be hard for any one of us walking through those stages, but can you imagine what it would feel like for a family, for, for all of those stages to be processed together going on under one roof? Well, today I'd like for us to look at a passage that in many ways resembles my home for the last few months. The Apostle Paul is writing a, a letter to the church in Thessalonica, and the people there have experienced some loss of loved ones. They're going through some grief. And the Bible doesn't tell us exactly what was happening relationally, but because they're people, we know that there were some who were sad and depressed. There were others who were shocked. 
while some might have been experiencing acceptance, uh, there were others who were very sad and angry. And man, when they came together, it just wasn't pretty. So Paul writes them a letter to kind of serve as a guide in their grief, to say, hey, when you're hurting, here's some steps that you can take that lead to life. It's found in 1 Thessalonians there on your outline. It says this. And now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died so that you will not grieve like people who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. So what can we learn from this passage? If you find yourself in a season of grief, which Jesus promised us that that we will all have at some point, what are some thoughts that lead to life, the first of which is there on your outline. I should grieve. I should grieve. Now in principle, I don't think any of us disagree with this, but my my question for you would be, do you actually do it? Do you actually do it? You know, if you receive news that a a loved one has passed away on a Monday, wherever you are, you know, at, at the office or work, you would head home, emotional, uh, you would call family. If they lived out of town, you would at some point get online and maybe purchase airline tickets or start packing a bag so that you can drive. You meet up with family wherever this loved one lived and you cry together, you share a few meals together. You begin preparing for a visitation and a memorial service. Maybe you stay a couple days afterwards because you've gotta do a little bit of planning regarding their possessions and estate or clean some things out, whatever you might do. You fly home on a Sunday, and somehow by Monday, you're supposed to step back into life as normal, show back up at work, when really the grieving process is just beginning, and life is gonna look anything but normal. So the question for us then is, what does it look like for me to grieve? If I'm supposed to grieve, whether it's by uh, in, in losing a loved one or in realizing of dreams that aren't going to be fulfilled, what does it look like for me to grieve? Well, biblically, there's a number of examples there on your outline we're gonna read through, and as we read through them, I'd encourage you to just listen for any common words or themes that you can underline that we'll talk about once we get through them, the first of which is in Genesis chapter 50 when Jacob died. It says, and the Egyptians wept for him 70 days when they came to the threshing floor of a tide which is beyond the Jordan, they lamented there with a very great and grievous lamentation and he made a mourning for his father seven days. When Aaron died in Numbers 20, it says, and when all the congregation saw that Aaron had perished, all the house of Israel wept for Aaron 30 days. When Moses died in Deuteronomy 34, it says Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was undimmed and his vigor unabated. And the people of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab for 30 days. Then the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. In 1 Samuel 1, when Saul and Jonathan died, it says, then David took hold of his clothes and tore them, and so did all the men who were with him. They mourned and wept and fasted until evening for Saul and Jonathan and his son, and for the Lord and for the house of Israel, because they had fallen by the sword. It's like, man, I looked hard anywhere in this message to find some humor, right? And this passage was one of them. It's like in each of these, if you know anything about David and Saul's story, David was anointed to be king, Saul was a wicked king, but David had worked hard to honor him. It's like in each of these passages, you see 30 days, 70 days, seven days. Well, when King Saul died, David said, you know what, I know it's important to mourn, so between lunch and dinner, you guys rip your clothes and be sad, then we're gonna party, right? (laughs) For the next four hours, we're gonna mourn. So what kind of themes did you see? What common language stood out to you as we read those passages? For me, there's four different things that come to mind that I think can serve as a helpful guide for you in grief. If you've got a pen, I'd encourage you to write these down. They're not on your outline sheet. The first of which is that in seasons of grief, we have to be attentive to time, attentive to time. In each of those passages, they, they allotted a certain period, a window of time for their grief. And for any one of you, grief is directly proportional to relationships. So the grieving widow is gonna grieve much more intensely and and longer than her best friend, right? Her friend is gonna hurt because a sister is hurting. The widow is gonna hurt because her soul has been ripped in half. Whatever the case, we see in these passages a people, a community who allotted a certain window of time for their pain and grieving. For Katie and I, 
Every time we butt heads or get frustrated with each other, it takes some time for us to remember, oh yeah, we're in a season of grief. So when you experience a loss or pain of some kind, it's important that you're attentive to time, that you give yourself the grace needed because your body's gonna respond in some ways that you don't get to control with fatigue and emotions, highs and lows. You have to be attentive to time, remembering that you're in a season of grief. Second, we have to be present mentally. Present mentally, not just attentive to time, but making a decision to give ourselves over to this season of grief. Oftentimes when you receive hard news of a a diagnosis or a loved one that's lost, it wasn't a decision that you made. You're thrown into this season of grieving where you feel powerless. You don't have any control while being present mentally gives you some control. It says, you know what, I'm gonna give myself into this season. I'm gonna allow myself to feel and do the things that I need to to ultimately bring me to a place of healing. So we have to be attentive to time, present mentally. Then we have to be available emotionally. For some of you ladies, this is a lot easier uh, for you than it is for the guys. For us to be available emotionally, man, we can feel like we need to be strong. We need to be strong for our families. We need to be strong for our kids. I'm supposed to be strong and set a good example for the other people around me, and so being strong looks like not being emotional, not crying, not doing so many of the things that our bodies need to do to help us experience some healing in life. You have to be available emotionally to say, you know what, in this window of time, I'm making a decision to give myself over fully to grief, to allow my body to feel the things that it needs to. Lastly, we have to be engaged spiritually. What we saw with King David and Saul and Jonathan's passing is that in that window of time where they mourned and grieved, they fasted as well. The purpose of fasting is the the breaking down of our flesh for the building up of our spirit. God, what do you have for me in this? Turning to God, seeking him, and in any moment or season of grief and pain in your life, the Bible tells us that God draws close to the brokenhearted. He saves those who are crushed in spirit. There's ever a time where you can be certain that you're in a thin place, that God is close to you. It's in your greatest moments of pain that it's important that we're engaged spiritually. Okay, God, what do you have for me here? When I think about the last couple of months in our home, I attribute my grief to the kindness of God. We have a a very full life. Man, we'll work a full day here at the church and then go home to a full night. With six kids, there is always a project, a play date, a sporting event, and we enjoy staying busy. Well, dad passed away on December 22nd, and our offices are closed the week between Christmas and New Year's because we have 85 Christmas services, right? (laughs) So we were closed that week. Then the first week of January, we had snowmageddon, right, where kids were out of school. It was like even Starbucks was closed, so nothing good was happening in Mount Pleasant. And so That whole week kind of forced us to stay home. Couldn't really get out and drive anywhere, do anything, so we stayed in pajamas and watched movies and talked and had downtime. Well, then the next week, Katie and I had a 15th anniversary trip. Our anniversary was actually the day before Dad passed, and so we had canceled that trip, sensing it was close, put it back on the calendar and had some extended time away. And as I look back on it now, I had three weeks of time just carved out that I wouldn't have experienced otherwise. I think my life would have looked like stepping back into the busyness and the usual pace and not really processing or grieving the way that I needed to, but God was, man, just so kind and giving me the time with Katie, with our kids, and with friends that I needed. It's important that I grieve. When you experience a loss of some kind, a relational loss, a dream, that we set aside time for God to do the work in us that he desires to do. Secondly there on your outline, I should grieve in community, in community. Again, in principle, I think we do this, uh, but I would say that we're, we're really good at the initial response, right? When you hear about a friend of yours who's lost a loved one or is experiencing grief of some kind, we're quick to shoot them a text message, an email, a phone call, stop by their house, send them flowers, take them a meal, something to say, I'm praying for you and I'm with you. The challenge is that grief is never a moment. It's never a meal. It's always a season and at some point it becomes the hurting person's responsibility to reach out to others to say, I need help. 
When as a community, we have to remember that the call for us is to grieve in community, to walk with brothers and sisters in their pain. And this is us, Jack and Rebecca, when they were pregnant with triplets, they lost the third baby upon delivery. They ended up adopting an abandoned child that was there at the hospital. And when they get home with three babies, Rebecca has this point where she's just overwhelmed with the weightiness of life, and so she bails. She doesn't tell Jack where she's going or, or if she'll even be back. And when she does show back up to the house, this is what happened. You know, I didn't know where you were the last four hours. I know. I'm sorry. I thought you ran off to Mexico and abandoned the kids. I would never run off to Mexico and abandon the kids without you. I promise. I can't stop thinking about the one we lost, Jack. I can't. I know. I know we have these new babies and I should be happy, but I just can't stop thinking about it. Me too. Yeah. Yeah. That's all I think about. You know, I feel, I feel guilty when I think about him, and, and then, you know, I, I feel guilty when I stop thinking about him. Be careful. I thought it was just me. Uh, it's me too. <laughs> Do you see the relief in her face when she realized she wasn't the only one feeling that kind of guilt and grief? She said, I thought it was just me. Can you imagine what their life would look like had they not had that moment together where they realized that they were both feeling the same pain? It's like at some point their guilt or grief would have turned into anger or sadness. They would have done their best to manage it, maybe through alcohol or medication. Whatever the case, it would have brought about conflict in their home and they would have taken it out on one another when really all they needed was each other. A willingness to grieve in community and talk with each other about how they were feeling. Jesus knew that we were gonna need each other in our grief and because of that, when he was on the cross looking out over people, he saw two folks, both of which who loved him, that were gonna need each other after he left and in John 19 there on your outline, this is what it says, when Jesus saw his mother there, and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby. He said to her, woman, here is your son, and to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, the disciple took her into his home. What Jesus was saying was, hey, in your grief, in your pain, I need you to draw closer together than you've ever been. I need you to love one another like family. So the question for us then is, what does that look like? A good example is in Job chapter two, after hearing that his wife and family had been lost, that Job was hurting, his friends go to see him. And there on your outline, it says, when they saw him from a distance, they could hardly recognize him. They began to weep aloud and they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads. They sat on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights. No one said a word to him because they knew how great his suffering was. Now, just as a side note in, in grief, if you have a friend that's hurting, tearing your clothes and showing up dirty, I'm not letting you in my house naked and dirty, you know? <laughs> unless you have a lasagna, you know, <laughs> and maybe, all right? You could read that passages and think, well, his friends didn't know what to say or do, but I think they knew exactly what to say and do. When someone is in that kind of grief, you're not gonna be able to offer words that lead to life, but man, there is a ministry to presence. A burden shared is a burden lightened, and just sitting there with him silent, communicated without communicating that I'm here for you, that I love you, and that you're not alone. Romans 12, 15 says it this way, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. I mean, there's a number of reasons why we don't do this in a prolonged manner. First of which is just because when we let everything out, it's not pretty. That's why they call it an ugly cry, right? 
It's like it doesn't matter how good you look, how pretty you are. When you're willing to let it go, it ain't pretty. And so you think, well, I'm just gonna keep that at the house. I'm still not all put back together. I'm gonna take another day off work. I don't want anybody to see me like that. Our temptation is to isolate and withdraw when the reality is that we need each other. My seven-year-old Asher, man, he's got all the words, right? He's a storyteller, and the truth is always somewhere in the middle, you know, of, of whatever the story is. And lately, he's been telling us that his friends weren't playing with him. He hasn't wanted to go to school. He's always loved school, loved his friends, been like the class clown, and, uh, but lately, that just hasn't been the case. And so, this past Monday, on the playground, um, Asher had isolated himself from, from the class, and a couple of his friends run over to him, and, and they said, Asher, why aren't you playing with us? And Asher's response is, don't you know what happened in my life? And all this, all this time, like, I haven't known what the truth was with Asher, but the truth is he's hurting inside, right? And he doesn't know how to process his emotions. If there's ever been a place where he felt at home, man, it's the playground. He's never met a stranger. He knows how to be silly and have fun but he finds himself in a place where he's had fun in the past, unable to have fun now because of the feelings of sadness, and so he's isolated. Man, whether you are seven or 57, the temptation in the midst of pain is gonna be to remove yourself from people, but the truth is we need one another in our grief. So it's important that I grieve in community. Lastly there on your outline, I should grieve in community with hope, with hope. What does that look like? First, or Second Corinthians 1, 3 through 11 there on your outline. It says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. This is the money verse, who comforts us in all of our troubles. He's not the dad that says, hey, come on, bud, get up. Your knees aren't even bleeding. It was just a fall, you're okay, you're not hurt. You know, that's what I do. That's not him. Father of compassion, God of all comfort, he deploys them in our times of need, comforts us in all of our troubles. Why? So that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. What that means for each of us today is if you find yourself in a season of grief or pain or loss, why is it important that I grieve? Because when Father God draws close to comfort me, there's gonna come a point later in life where he uses the same comfort I received from God, not to comfort somebody else in my own strength, in my own knowledge, in my own ability, but to comfort them with the very comfort I received from God. That means there's purpose to your pain. Whatever it may be that you're walking through today, if you'll be present mentally, engaged emotionally, if you'll give yourself over to this season of grief, God will use it later uh, to bring about good in someone else's life. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. And our hope for you is firm. Why is it important that we grieve in community? Because in our pain, it can be so easy for us to lose hope. We need people around us that won't let us get stuck in any of the seasons of grief won't let us hang too long in the seasons of anger. You're gonna feel the same pain tomorrow that you did today if all you do is focus on yesterday. We walk through our grief with people so that they can help us move along because their hope can be firm for us when ours is not. Our hope for you is firm because we know that just as you share in our suffering, so also you share in our comfort. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. And for anyone who's experienced grief or loss in their life, man, that sentence best captures it. It felt like I had received a sentence of death. A sorrow had come over me that I, that I couldn't shake. But this happened, he says, that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. If you ask yourself, why am I still here? Why did this happen to me? Why do I feel like I've come to the end of myself? It's so that you would rely on God. 
so that you would lean into him, the God who raises the dead. He has delivered us. He has delivered us in the past. He will deliver us in the future. On him, we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us as you help us by your prayers. Then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor granted us and answer to the prayers of many. I should grieve in community with hope. Man, we live in a world today where we are surrounded by sorrows, bombarded with tragedy. You barely have time to grieve after hearing about one school shooting or bombing or personal tragedy before you're bombarded with news of another. Man, apart from the hope of Jesus, our world is a mess. How do we find hope? For many of you today, as we begin to respond here in Mount Pleasant and across all of our campuses, we're gonna sing a song, and the opening lines of that song say, are you hurting and broken within, overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. And church today, it's important for you to know that if you're hurting and broken for any reason, the loss of a loved one, a dream or vision for your life that you've been preparing for, that you've realized isn't gonna be yours to attain or experience. Man, we worship a God who draws close to us in our pain. If we'll allow ourselves to grieve in community, we can find hope in Jesus. And for many of you today, I'm praying and believing you're gonna find that hope maybe for the first time. Maybe it'll look like you becoming part of the family of God, praying a prayer of faith, saying, God, I don't, I don't have that hope in my life. I wanna receive the free gift of love from you that you would send your son to die on the cross for my sin, that by making a profession of faith in him, I might have eternal life, acknowledging that Paul said to be absent with the body is to be present with the Lord. Jesus said to the thief on the cross, today you shall be with me in paradise. By making a profession of faith in Jesus, we don't have to live as a people who have no hope. That's the point Paul was making here. Don't grieve as people who have no hope. Man, as believers, don't allow this season of sadness to overshadow the promise of eternity. There's so much about our lives that are uncertain, but where we spend our eternal home is one that we can lock down today. And I'm praying for many of you, that'll be the prayer you pray. For others, maybe in your, in your grief, it's time to take a step towards community. And today we've tried to do that as easy as we can. All you have to do is text the word grief to 320-320. We believe God presses in in our pain and we wanna be a church that presses in in your pain. Whatever that might look like, there's many different small groups and resources available, but all you have to do is text grief to 320-320 and your campus pastor will follow up with you on what that looks like. It's important that I grieve in community with hope. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much that you are the Father of compassion, the God of all comfort, who draws close to comfort us in all of our troubles. And I pray for everyone under the sound of my voice today, whether it's a pain and a grief that is raw and fresh that we're very much in the thick of today, or maybe one that happened years ago that we suppressed or stuffed down and have never really leaned into you on. God, I pray that our hearts would be open before you that we would encounter you as the God who loves us and is crazy about us. God, would you lead us down a path of life? Would you usher in healing in our lives today, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.